Side five. <laughs> Florence? France. No. No, it was still in Florence. Right. right. When I got to Fulbright, uh, because of the sale of this painting, I decided to go. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to go to Greece. Mm -hmm. always had. So we went to Greece first. Mm -hmm. We drove from England mm -hmm. to Greece. Through Yugoslavia. Oh, well, oh, wow. Oh, those wonderful roads you yeah. learned so much about. <laughs> and actually, I was very disappointed because Yugoslavia was so extraordinary. Mm -hmm. I was sorry we only got a visa for a week. Mm -hmm. And I did think of extending it, but I was really anxious to get there. Mm -hmm. but it's extraordinary because you have feelings about work and people mm -hmm. in that country that are extraordinary. In and what way? Well, you just have a feeling of people doing things constantly. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the first thing, it was very mysterious. And mm. I guess, in a way, I've never really been prone to that kind of reaction. And maybe that was like the first time it ever mm. had happened. But when we went from Trieste to Mujeka, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. it's like through an incredibly barren, area, mm -hmm. like you don't see anybody, which was true mm -hmm. through lots of Yugoslavia, because mm -hmm. we took the coastal roads. Mm -hmm. And I mean, had weird images, like mm -hmm. death, and the, there were craters, which I la mm -hmm. later understood better, but mm -hmm. at the time, driving through this kind of woods till we mm -hmm. got to Yuteka, I just had all these, hot, well, I thought it must have been from the war, yeah. and you'd see little green things at the bottom, and you think of people cultivating mm. something, mm. you know. But there was a strange feeling, it was really mysterious. Yeah, then you'd come through places that were more populated and see people. And we happened to pass at a time when, I guess, people were getting off work, because it was late in the mm. afternoon. And first of all, they were the most beautiful people, in general, mm. that I've ever seen any place. Mm. You know, it's brilliant blue mm -hmm. eyes mostly, mm -hmm. and extraordinary, intense features, and just unbelievably healthy. I mean, I later saw some very ugly Yugoslavs, <laughs> but <laughs> to start with, it wasn't yeah. like that. Yeah. And then, as it got darker, you'd see people like working at their own, obviously their own houses, like mm -hmm. cutting wood and doing something. I mean, you have just a, a sense of work and activity, and mm -hmm. I mean, horrible things too. Like there was a big. Um, detour at some point because the army was going to be using the coastal road and we had to go some wild way mm -hmm. and of course you had to keep looking at the map because there were gas stations like god knows how many miles <laughs> apart yeah. and it was i mean i i mean if i started to tell you like all the things that happened in yugoslavia that could be like four mm -hmm. hours right there mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. very peculiar experiences mm -hmm. some of which were good and some of which were kind of horrible but very mm. evocative of all kinds of mm -hmm. things mm -hmm. that I didn't even know mm -hmm. that I was capable of mm -hmm. feeling, like mm -hmm. very mysterious psychic mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. You know, like we walked when the day we got to Echo, we walked out after this hideous dinner that we had, and the streets were just about empty, and we looked at some shops and the place was just deserted, and then suddenly we heard some guy playing a recorder or something. Mm -hmm. Like really wild. I mean it was like a constant movie in a yeah, sense. You yeah, know. Yeah. Or going to hotels that obviously have been super luxury hotels mm -hmm. in the old days and staying there for very little mm -hmm. very very or my getting into a bath after a long journey and then I stepped in and it was ice cold, you know, because <laughs> there was no hot water. Just what you wanted, and yeah. it was one of those places that obviously kings and royalty had stayed in. Like there was yeah. two of everything, like two washstands mm -hmm. and huge mm -hmm. fixtures and a fantastic terrace with wonderful mm -hmm. the only decent food we had on that trip. And it was that was in split, I think. When they arrived like mm -hmm. eleven o'clock at night or something. Barely having gotten there with the <laughs> car and the car broke down, you know, like all kinds oh, of things, dear, which had nothing yeah. to do with Yugoslavia. Mm -hmm. I mean, that part. But adventure after adventure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why did you want to go to Greece? What was the. I've always wanted to be an ancient Greek. <laughs> 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 and I finally figured out what it was. Mm -hmm. Two summers ago, I read the 
the book on Kerouac. Mm -hmm. And during the course of it, they talked about Dr. Sachs, which I never read. Mm -hmm. But he talked about the effect of comic strips and things mm -hmm. on his on that particular book. Right. And it's possible that I remembered this before, mm -hmm. but I probably would, as I said, didn't acknowledge it. Mm -hmm. Right. I like to prefer to pretend to be unconscious. And I think I really mm -hmm. did mm -hmm. forget. And then when I was reading that part, I remembered that when I was a child, my parents got the Journal American in the Daily News. Mm -hmm. I was really brought up <laughs> the best of everything. And in the Journal American, they used to have a thing every Sunday in which this woman would go into an old jewelry store or something mm -hmm. and look at some gem and be transported back to ancient Egypt or Greece or mm -hmm. Rome or something, mm -hmm. right? And also, mm -hmm. at about, not about the same time, when I was about 11 or 12, my father picked up some books at a sale at Macy's and my mother was very upset because one of them, I don't remember the name of, but it was what in those days would probably be considered a dirty book. But it was about a courtesan in ancient Greece. And I don't know which started the interest because I think I was interested even before. But just the clothing, the whole thing, because I remember as a child going to the library and maybe at 11 or 12 and looking up like Mm -hmm. the costume, mm -hmm. and I knew about like how mm -hmm. to make it, like mm -hmm. I ever, ne ever, never actually made one, mm -hmm. but I looked it up, and it was like a wonderful thing, and when mm -hmm. I read that book, I could just, it was fantastic, yeah. walking yeah. down the street in this, you know, yellow whatever it was, mm -hmm. so I've always mm -hmm. loved it, and I've loved Greek art, mm -hmm. I don't think I knew very much about it, because my interest in our history, as I mm -hmm. told you, was Minimal, mostly because it's so boring. But what happened once you got there and saw it? Was, well, you know, when I, we got to place. Greece itself mm -hmm. from Yugoslavia, it was horrible. <laughs> they, this is better than a fire engine. <laughs> <laughs> when we got to Greece, yeah. we didn't speak for about three hours because I guess we were both in a kind of state of shock mm -hmm. because the contrast between this incredibly vivid exciting workmanlike atmosphere mm -hmm. this kind of flaccid Greek mm. countryside. I mean there Where like did you, you come into Greece then? At um On the Salonica. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But like when you went through Yugoslavia, you know, you'd go along the road and suddenly you'd look up on this road that was on one side like straight down to the sea. Mm -hmm. And the other side was, you know, part of a mountain mm -hmm. or something. And there would be like a plot about maybe two feet by seven feet or something with a tree in it. Mm -hmm. And it was cultivated. Mm -hmm. And there was a cow, <laughs> you know, or you even <laughs> looked down. Yeah. And there would be this tiny mm -hmm. little plot of land and it was like worked. Mm -hmm. And you'd park the car because Jane was in a period when later I found out that it wasn't that she was being toilet trained, it was that she couldn't stand the hot car. Mm. But she would say, she was like, just over two, and she'd say, I want to pee now first. <laughs> so we'd stop the car and take mm -hmm. out the traveling potty mm -hmm. and put her down. And it would be like an incredibly deserted area, like mm -hmm. at the edge mm -hmm. of a cliff overlooking mm -hmm. the Adriatic. That's the one that's between right. Greece and Okay. And then within seconds, about four or five people would appear. <laughs> and you don't know where, like you didn't uh, see a house mm -hmm. or anything, but somewhere they were there. And you know, there was like a whole scene one time with these two women having this incredibly jealous thing about who was to hold it, and it got really <laughs> creepy. But that's what I mean, like almost nothing that happened yeah. was like normal yeah. or casual. It was either very, very good or very, very bad, but yeah. all like with overtones of strange yeah. vibrations. Yeah. So what happened in Greece? I mean, finally you do... Well, draw. we got there, and of course I loved the art. Mm -hmm. I couldn't stand the people, the food, or the, pl or the place, because... 
later, when I went to Crete, which I went did alone, because mm -hmm. by that time it was obvious the check was going to arrive and we mm -hmm. had to change our plans. But I really wanted to go, so mm -hmm. Terry said, well, yeah, let's go. So I went, and I met someone that I had seen at Delphi, which is where we stayed for a month. Mm -hmm. Like, we went to Athens first, and mm -hmm. when we saw the check wasn't going to be there, we changed our plans and we started traveling towards Delphi. And I remember spending time like near where the spring was and sort of picking mm -hmm. little things out of the ruins and seeing this girl who was sketching. And when I went to Crete, I saw her again. Huh. And she was from California, so she explained like why I found Greece mm -hmm. so unappetizing as opposed yeah. to all the descriptions. Like Leonard had been there mm -hmm. a couple of years before and yeah. Wolf had been there. And they'd all had like rave stories, but they'd all gone in May uh -huh. or April or something. And I was there like in from June to August 1st, and it mm. was totally arid mm. and hot mm -hmm. in a way that I had never experienced before. Mm -hmm. And this girl was from California. So she said, well, you know, I'm used to it mm. because that's how it is in California. Like the hills are barren, and I'm used yeah. to a green, mm -hmm. lush thing. So I was terribly disappointed from the mm -hmm. description in terms of the physicality. But like, mm. where we lived in Delphi, mm -hmm. probably a hundred people out of 101 would think it was like heaven mm -hmm. and I really didn't like it. I mean we had a view of like Utea mm -hmm. and the bay and the mountains mm -hmm. and the whole thing. We were like on the last street. As a matter of fact one morning we got up very early and walked up to the stadium mm -hmm. from where we lived so it was fantastic and I did mm -hmm. work there because mm -hmm. we stayed there a month. But the art absolutely knocked me out. Hmm. But what, what about the climate and everything, what didn't appeal to you? I mean, the dryness of it? Or well, because everyone's description had been the lushness and the flowers and... Mm. Oh, they'd been there in the spring. Yeah, and I got spring. there and, like, they were... Actually, we went back the next spring, mm -hmm. and we went back to Delphi. And then on the road, there were places that during the summer I had thought were deserted, mm -hmm. right, and abandoned stone houses, and I realized that they... There were people living there, but in the summer, like, everyone stays inside, it's mm -hmm. so hot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was just glaring, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, but the art absolutely wiped me out. Mm -hmm. so, and that was the primary purpose of it. Mm -hmm. What did you dislike about the food and the people and the rest of it? Was it <coughs> just the well, you'd go to the butcher about. store, mm -hmm. and of course we didn't speak Greek, except mm -hmm. we learned, please, thank you, and milk, <laughs> 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 you know. Uh. But, You'd go and you'd point to, for instance, when we lived in Delphi, and we'd go mm -hmm. into the butcher store. And I remember Terry describing his trip because, strangely enough, the men do a lot of the shopping in Greece. Mm -hmm. And he went in and he said how he described the lamb chops, mm -hmm. you know, like that. Mm -hmm. And the guy said, oh, yes. And then he went, chung, 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 chung. And so we'd end up with a lamb chop that was like this thick at one end, and, you know, it was impossible uh, to close. Uh, but in the restaurants, it was mostly dreadful, except that was touristy, too, because when we ate out in Delphi in the summer, mm -hmm. when we lived there, it was awful. And when we went back in the spring, we ate in some of the same places, and we had a fantastic meal, because there was hmm. nothing except for one table that had some tourists. I mean, first of all, there were like 10 people in the whole place, but there were mostly Greeks, and so he was really cooking, and it was hmm. delicious. On the mainland, except for one place where I had the best artichoke I've ever had in my life, it was near the Agora. Mm -hmm. The food was all greasy. Like mm -hmm. to me, it was a miracle. I never, I never got sick. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you'd get like meatballs swimming in half an inch of oil, and like, but I didn't mm -hmm. get sick. I mean, it was all right, but it mm -hmm. wasn't, you know, yeah. delicious. Yeah. Especially coming from France. Also, I was because of the incredibly cold winter. It had been mm -hmm. the coldest winter that had in Europe like in 50 years. I also had a cold most of the time mm -hmm. when we were. Mm -hmm. Oh no, that was the second trip. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, but the first time, it just wasn't good. That's all. It was. Mm -hmm. um, Have you been back then? Not for that second mm -hmm. spring. Mm -hmm. Another but time. I'm still living on it. <laughs> <laughs> no. As I noticed. Uh, yeah. Well, that actually is a tiny little statue in, in the garden of the woman who did the article mm -hmm. for art. The, pa the, uh, the painting. Yeah. yeah. It's a 
tiny little thing and playing that just did. But when I went up there, she wanted mm -hmm. me to see what she'd written so far to check it for mm -hmm. factual errors and stuff. So I stopped on the way to take Kate to Who's camp. That? Who's that? Noel Frackman. Oh yeah. And I stopped off and it was it's kind of a great day, so I took some photographs of that. Because it mm -hmm. looked kind of nice. Anyway, Fulbright, what do you what do you think of those? I mean, was it useful for you in well, some ways? Well, luckily, Charles begins, once I got back to France, I mean, mm -hmm. I was strapped the whole summer. Mm -hmm. And even though we did a little bit of traveling, it was very rough. Like, mm -hmm. Charles sent me money, mostly because he expected to be paid for this painting. But once I got to France, to start with, it was rough, mm -hmm. but around December, like the money started rolling in at regular intervals when mm -hmm. we started selling paintings again. And then we really could operate, we take trips and mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. And I found a very cheap place outside of Paris. Cold. I have never in my entire life been so cold. Where about the battle? It was in a town called Bursley, you bet. How'd you find it? Well, because you have to be oriented, mm -hmm. right? And we were so broke that we, I had been put in my application that I wanted to stay in the south of France because Dodie was living in France at the time. Mm -hmm. And even though I didn't know her that well, then we were mm -hmm. in vague correspondence. Right. I mean, she'd posed for me, but I still mm -hmm. didn't know that well. And she said that the prices in Paris were enormous. Mm -hmm. So I had put in my application I wanted to stay in the south of France. And when I had my interview, mm -hmm. I said it again. You know. mm -hmm. So when we got there, and it was obvious that we were really in bad shape, mm -hmm. Terry stayed with the children in a little resort town that, of course, was totally deserted. It was almost like a development, like it was developed as a resort mm -hmm. area, so it was totally empty, and we had this disgusting little place. And he was going to stay there and maybe look around for a place mm -hmm. that was better while I had to go up to mm -hmm. Paris to be oriented. When I got there, it was the usual bureaucratic garbage, and it turned out I was supposed to stay there. And I said, but I did this. He said, well, if you want to, you didn't have to write a letter. So I wrote a letter, but I never got to send it because, like, um, Max Coslock was there, who I hadn't known before. And I stayed with Jody like for three weeks, mm -hmm. which was extraordinary because, except for one, like I didn't really know her well, and mm -hmm. I am not easy to live with, as we probably <laughs> established by now. And I didn't know how long it would last, mm -hmm. and there was a lot of nerve for me to ask to stay with her, but mm -hmm. she's very generous. And she, I don't think, is so easy to get along with mm -hmm. either. But aside from one sarcastic word, it was unbelievable. And the day mm -hmm. I decided I wanted to paint, I thought, oh my God, when she comes back and sees that I've gotten some mm -hmm. canvas and some stretches, right. and no problem. Mm -hmm. I mean, we worked mm -hmm. in this big room, and we'd like, step back from our work and say, excuse me, as we passed each other, <laughs> stepping back. And it was incredible. Was anyway, one, after one of these sessions, there was a guy who someone had put me in touch with because he was going to go straight from New York. There was a complication about getting work or getting supplies over there. Mm -hmm. Because since I wasn't going to wait until the time when they send you, I was going mm -hmm. three months early so I could go to Greece. He brought a lot of stuff over mm -hmm. for me. So I had met him mm -hmm. briefly. He had a Fulbright too. And the three of us were standing on the corner one day. And I don't remember whether Max had heard about this place or this other guy had. And he said he was going to go out there. And I heard like $50 a month. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and luckily this guy said he wasn't going to take it. So I went out there to look at it. And it was perfect. I mean, it was perfect for the money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was in an old broken down chateau. Mm -hmm. And it had like, a huge kitchen, one bedroom, a thing they called a bathroom, which had nothing in it but a sink and a bidet, which mm -hmm. became my studio. Mm -hmm. And then a large thing they called the granary. Oh. 
there was this thing they called the great room, which is a huge room. It was totally uninsulated, so it was out of the question to use. I had to, and I'm, it was an incredible scene with a dreadful woman who was like a witch. And we, I was there in September to be oriented, mm -hmm. and the place wasn't going to be ready till November 1st because they had to reparation it, see? Mm. <laughs> because Peter Stahl had been there before, and apparently there were burn holes in the floor and like all kinds of things, mm -hmm. and they wouldn't let us just come in. Go out, no. So for a month, like, it was obvious that I couldn't hassle this whole letter writing mm -hmm. thing and this whole dumb bureaucratic garbage. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so he came up, and I guess we must have gotten some money from Charles by then. So we, I think we went to Belgium. Holland or something. Mm -hmm. And we kind of twiddled around. We stayed like a week in Paris and mm -hmm. whatever. Anyway, we sort of managed to stay occupied until we mm -hmm. could get back to this place. And we arrived in the, in the rain. And they did a whole number because we were a day late and they thought we'd gotten killed. I mean, Jesus <laughs> Christ. I mean, you don't know what that woman was like. And she said, Your car's messy. You'll probably, you know, ruin this place. And you can have it for a month. So I, you know, hysterically called the person mm -hmm. in charge the next day, who was like a typical awful mm -hmm. bureaucrat, or I wrote him or something, and I said, you know, I have to have some assurance that I mm -hmm. can stay here, because first of all, we waited until November right. to come in. Right. Second of all, I obviously can't start working if I know that she can kick us out in a month. Mm -hmm. And he wrote back a letter, which unfortunately I destroyed, <laughs> because that would have been a great addition to the archives. It was one sentence mm -hmm. long, and it was something like, if I maintain a level of cleanliness commensurate with what Americans are known for, I'm sure you'll have no trouble. Like, that was it. <laughs> right in the, and I had written like a four-page, you know, oh, letter yeah. full of feeling about how I had asked for the South of France to begin with, and then I had, you know, done this, and I've been oh, traveling oh. around, waiting for this place, and this whole thing, and I get back this one crummy shithead statement. I mean, that's why I should really control my anger, because, you know, whoever he is, mm -hmm. I'd like to send Somewhere. him a copy now. He's probably working for the State Department or CIA or something. Yeah. Maybe he was then. <laughs> but anyway, it worked out, so I stayed there, and I mm -hmm. did an enormous amount of work, considering mm -hmm. I was freezing to death. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it was also, also a nightmare, because even though, as everyone will tell you who knew me, Terry was very helpful you know, with the kids, but he right. never did everything. Mm -hmm. And there, he really had to do everything. Like, now mm -hmm. I know why the French is so mean. I mean, it's dark until about 10 o'clock in the morning, mm -hmm. and it gets dark again around 4. Mm -hmm. So the only way I could work, more or less, and we were all sleeping in the same room, we had two kids, and one of them, you know, it was mm -hmm. like a flop house. There's only a It's unbelievable. Oh. And we were freezing to death. Oh. And in the kitchen, there was a coal stove. Mm -hmm. In the bedroom there was a kerosene heater, so I put that on about an hour before the kids went to bed, but I wasn't, I couldn't leave it on because mm -hmm. I was afraid they'd get right. killed or something, or we all would. Mm -hmm. So I would put it out, I'd put them to bed fully clothed with hats and sweaters <laughs> and a whole schmear. There were so many times that we would sort of stand in front of the stove and warm mm -hmm. up and then race into bed, and I'd have something on like tights, sweatpants, two sweaters, oh, a sweatshirt, and then if we only touched like a hip and an ankle and our heads to the bed after maybe about mm -hmm. half an hour, and clung tightly together, maybe, <laughs> we could start removing a few layers of clothing after about half an hour. Oh, incredible. I have never been so cold. And I worked in what they called the bathroom. Mm -hmm. you know, the bathroom was like two or three flights down, <laughs> which was great on a cold winter morning. Oh, anyway, okay. so I worked in this thing, and I did a landscape. Mm -hmm. And so, and we took the window out because the only way I could really see properly. Mm -hmm. So it was freezing cold, and I keep that kerosene heater like about a foot away from me. And mm -hmm. if Terry brought me tea, mm -hmm. I could work for 40 minutes. If he did not bring me tea, I could work for 20 minutes. And then I had to go back in the kitchen, stand in front of the stove, and warm up again so I could go back. I'd stay in bed till like 10 till it got light. Oh, it was the yeah. only way I could work. It was a nightmare because I'd lose track of like mm -hmm. where the kids were. Mm -hmm. And find you know, like every now and then I would take a day off and do something human like mm -hmm. walking around 
mm -hmm. yard or something, or go across the street and go mm -hmm. shopping. And of course, the French people thought it was all very funny because he did all the shopping except for those rare mm -hmm. times when I decided this was getting ridiculous and wow. I had to stop because mm -hmm. I, you know, I, kids were doing things I didn't know what they were doing. I wasn't watching it. Mm -hmm. It was absolutely horrendous, like truly horrendous. I felt guilty as hell because I disrupted mm -hmm. everyone's life. Mm -hmm. And I figured the only way I could compensate was to work mm -hmm. because it was the mm -hmm. only, right. I mean, at that point, like to work meant to sell mm -hmm. because I was doing fairly mm -hmm. well that way. Mm -hmm. So it was the only way I felt that I could justify this stressful mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. And of course, we didn't even go away in the winter time because mm -hmm. the weather all over France was so terrible. Like it was snow in Marseille for the first time in 50 years. Then there was this hysterically funny story in the Herald Tribune. <laughs> where there was a town that had been snowed in for something like two weeks, and the first truckload got in. You know what it was filled with? What? Oysters. <laughs> <laughs> Marvelous. Perfect. Uh, anyway, so when spring came, we did take a trip. But I tell you, I was so cold to the bone that I don't think I warmed up. I took an extra week, which I got penalized for. Like, I never got the check for that. And there was no way I could explain. I mean, they were, you know, really pussycat. I said I didn't go away in the winter, mm -hmm. like for Christmas vacation, because of that. Mm -hmm. I've been sick, which I really was. I mean, we picked up mm -hmm. a lot of wine in France to take to Greece, mm -hmm. which we never used because I was too ill to drink. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> right. oh, oh, and dear. I mean, yeah. I felt like I didn't warm up until the last week in Greece. We were there, mm -hmm. I think, three weeks. And unfortunately, the day we left was the day that it was fantastic, like mm. it was May 1st, and all right. those little flowers were on. Everything I missed a lot, because I should have actually stayed, because mm. I never saw the temple of Versailles. Mm. I mean, I think we started going there, and then we couldn't find it. We didn't know how far it was. We were afraid we would miss mm. the boat that we had already booked, unfortunately. Mm. Mm -hmm. So we didn't see that, although we mm. did go to Corinth, and that was one of those but we went back and it was just cold. I mean, it was good and, I mean, I, I wouldn't knock it, but you know, like the guy who had told me about this place, mm -hmm. right, and who right. Would then decided to stay in France. Like, I tried to figure out one day how he made it. He was paying $40 a month rent for one room. Of course, mm -hmm. he was freezing to death, too, because everybody was. Mm -hmm. and I thought, he has only that, like he has no other income. Mm -hmm. And I figured out that when you took the rent out, he had something like $2 a day to spend on hmm. food, hmm. which no. was Not pretty much. incredible, because I don't think <coughs> he had a place to cook, mm -hmm. like he might have had a hot pot or something. And if you have to eat out, there's not much you can do mm -hmm. for $2 right. a day. Plus, you know, there were two materials allowances right. during the year. So that even for one person it was rough. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we never would have made it if there wasn't something coming in. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I don't know what they're doing now. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if it's the only way that you can get to Europe, of course it's worth it. You do. Yeah. 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 What about your Walter Gutman Foundation? Uh, well, that was only $500, and that was the year before when I went mm -hmm. to Florence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I've never been Walter's type, so I guess getting five hundred dollars <laughs> was like a great concession on his part. What do you mean you've never been his type? Well, I'm not strong enough. <laughs> Vicious enough. Although once he kissed my big toe. I mean, uh -huh. he doesn't well, you yes, he doesn't dislike me. I'm just no. not like his, his, his kind of person. No, you know. he does have specific kinds of persons, doesn't he, yeah. uh, Walter? Uh, <coughs> Anyway, so the Fulbright was what year again? 62 the to 63. 62, 63. Yeah. And uh, I stayed on after that. Mm -hmm. For how long? Uh, I think I stayed at the Chateau until like... I think at the end of July, the beginning of August. Mm -hmm because I was finishing that big painting. Mm -hmm. And then we went to England again to visit. Mm -hmm. Actually, we stayed with friends this time, and that was very pleasant. Mm -hmm. And 
then I saw all the things I didn't see on the first trip when I went to the Brooklyn Museum. Uh, Brooklyn Museum. The <laughs> British Museum. <laughs> well, they have nice uh, ancient uh, things too. <laughs> Not quite yeah. the same thing. And that totally freaked me out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And and it was interesting for other reasons because obviously in Greece the marble is all the color of grease and warm like flesh. Mm -hmm. And in England it's become gray like London. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I presume that the, that mm -hmm. stone was the same color as on the Acropolis to begin with. Mm -hmm. but it's, mm -hmm. Even though it's in the museum. Whether that, whether it's a fantastic museum. Mm -hmm. As we all know. I mean, right. has no original statement, but I really mm -hmm. loved it. Mm -hmm. Because I think we spent the whole time Except for one, well, I think we spent the whole time in London, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. either ten days or two weeks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, once you came back here, uh, you were with Alan for a while, then you switched to Graham some years later. Well, because you know, by that time he really hadn't done anything dramatic for quite a while, and mm -hmm. I had a show that I thought was very good, but. Mm -hmm. I think those two were in it. And he really wasn't selling paintings. I think Howard had left by that time. Mm -hmm. I've forgotten what he was. I've yeah. forgotten too, but it was obvious that he hadn't been doing well. And mm -hmm. I went to a number of places. Mm -hmm. And of course, it was a horrible shock when I settled in with Graham and then went up there and discovered I was on the second floor rather than one of the contemporary artists. Mm -hmm. Because hmm. I felt that that was really Why did that happen? Well, I had never even thought to discuss it with him. Like, he just came down to the studio and said, yes, he was interested. And I settled it. Charles didn't mm -hmm. speak to me for two years, mm -hmm. even though he sent me a complete photostat of all the records, which mm -hmm. I didn't ask for, needless to say, mm -hmm. and was part of like his scrupulous honesty. Because mm -hmm. it never would have occurred to me to ask for something like that. And it never occurred to me mm -hmm. that anyone ever did. You know, he just mm -hmm. sent me like all the ledger pages mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. my, my time with right. him. But he really hadn't done anything for mm -hmm. quite a while. Mm -hmm. And I think Howard might have left because afterwards is when I found out that basically Howard was the one that did the selling because mm -hmm. Charles had just alienated everybody. Mm -hmm. And also didn't believe in all the things that are necessary and I was too dumb even then to realize no, 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 exactly yeah, what was at yeah, stake and yeah. how much I had to do with my own mm -hmm, thing mm -hmm. and I still didn't think mm -hmm, that I had to mm -hmm. do it and the time with Graham was kind of a disaster also mm -hmm. because that, there was no communication mm -hmm. particularly after I you know the guy that was in charge of the second floor was like a nothing and I remember coming in one day and someone was looking Mm -hmm. at, I had a little landscape in that show, and I walked in unexpectedly, and this guy had one of Lennox's landscapes next to mine, <laughs> so he obviously was trying to sell yeah. Lennox rather than mine, and mm -hmm. that really, you know, obviously, you know, Lennox's a great friend, and he's happy yeah. to move tomorrow and everything, but, still. but it, you know, like, yeah. I know that's how it works a lot, but that's yeah. not one of your favorite things to see. And they, yeah. as far yeah. as I can remember, sold nothing out of the show. Mm -hmm. And the only time they sold anything, it was like hell trying to get this minute amount of money out of it. Mm -hmm. You know, even though he's, and that was out of a show I had in Rhode Island, which had nothing to do well, with it. How did that show come about at Rhode Island School? Lucas, mm -hmm. because Lucas was posing for me then, mm -hmm. and as a matter of fact, he tried to get me into pace, and they mm -hmm. weren't interested. Mm -hmm. But I said, you know, like I really got to do something. I mean, he's posing for me mm -hmm. for five months, so I assume he discussed <laughs> everything <laughs> in depth. Uh, and he said, well, there's this Ford Foundation thing. And so I found out about, like, mm -hmm. you know, like I really mm -hmm. don't know about anything unless mm -hmm. somebody tells me. Mm -hmm. And he told me that this thing was going, and I told the American Federation of the Arts. Mm -hmm. And I was, I called like halfway through the program, like I hadn't heard zilch about it. Mm -hmm. And they sent me a letter saying that, you know, right. I spoke to Robert Locke, who was very mm -hmm. nice, so I don't know where he is now. But anyhow, he, you know, got the information. I told him I wanted the Southwest because I'd never been mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. So they sent me 
Rhode Island School of Design, <laughs> which actually turned out better because I had friends there. And yeah. Terry and the kids came Not up with this teaching kids. project? Or no, it was a weird thing that the Ford Foundation did to use up their money, I presume. Mm -hmm. And it was visiting artists to the museum. Oh. And people were sent to all kinds of wild places. Mm -hmm. So when I found that out, I realized I was actually luckier mm -hmm. to be in Rhode Island where it was attached to a school and therefore mm -hmm. they could give me a good studio. Right. I had friends, like George Morrison was teaching mm -hmm. at Rhode Island School, so that I was very, like I probably lived in mm -hmm. his house in Hazel, and Hazel posed for me. It was like the mm -hmm. one major mm -hmm. painting I did while I was up there. And I spoke, spoke to the students mm -hmm. a little bit. And nobody knew what to do with you. Like I arrived the day that I was supposed to. When I went in to see the publicity director of the museum, and he looked at me and he said, <coughs> exactly what are you supposed to do here? <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't know. I mean, in the letter they said you, you're supposed to kind of shake up the community, mm -hmm. and, bring, and I did. But <laughs> other no, ways. <laughs> in other ways, right. It's like they yeah. give you a one-person show, and supposedly mm -hmm. they... And I, now I figure that... Um, there was an allowance to the museum to buy something. Mm -hmm. I figure now, that after they bought the smallest painting that was in the show, mm -hmm. that probably Danny Robbins, who was the director then, finagled and mm -hmm. probably used a small portion of what they gave him and mm -hmm. probably used the rest for something else, because mm -hmm. I can't believe the allowance was as small as the painting they bought. Yeah. To try to get the money out of Graham was unbelievable. Mm -hmm. See, it was how he was so rich and I was so poor. Oh, the way though. Uh, yes, those are the worst. Like yeah. the dentists and doctors, well, they're not so poor either. But uh, you know, like your friends who work for a living yeah. manage to make regular installment yeah. payments when they buy something on time. All right. Uh, how was that show successful, though, from your point of view at Rhode Island? Well, the students loved it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think it was a good show. Because mm -hmm. that was one, of, I mean, that was right after one of the best painting years I've ever had mm -hmm. in 65. Mm -hmm. And that's how I shook them up, because they had me talk to what, the, I didn't know there was a word called docents. Mm -hmm. Apparently, there are people who take people around the museum. Right. And yeah. so there was a whole group of women that I was supposed to talk to. And as I said, being dumb, I figured out afterwards that I was supposed to mm -hmm. tell them about my work so they could tell the Other four people. unsuspecting uh -huh. kids uh -huh. that would come about it. Instead, I talked about the whole process of going to museums. At that point, the kids had been up, mm -hmm. and Jane, who was six, then mm -hmm. totally freaked out. I mean, they have a fantastic collection in some ways. They have one of the best small ancient art collections I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. Then they had, and I was looking mm -hmm. at that, and she came in and she wrecked. You gotta see. You just gotta look. You gotta see this. And she pulled me into the next room, and there was like a fourth or fourteenth century. I can't, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know. But this incredible wooden crucifix mm -hmm. from Germany was just mm -hmm. beautiful. And then I remember we went around the rest of the museum and got to this great big room. And the other end of it opened back into this place, and she went racing down the whole thing, went to the back in front of it, and stood in front of it, and put her hands behind her back. And, <laughs> anyway, so I use that as an example of yeah. like how art should be looked at. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. in the course of my being there the first few weeks, I'd seen this dreadful woman who really was like Ilse Kant, and who really did wear a blue serge skirt <laughs> and this huge thing oh, of dear. keys yeah. talking to groups of students. Mm -hmm. And it was like the usual museum scene where mm -hmm. someone's talking at them, right. and they really want to go down there mm -hmm. and look but they're polite, and this was like private school kids, mm -hmm. because I remember there was like 10 boys in suits and mm -hmm. you know all the same jackets. Right. So I started talking about the process of museum going somehow, and this woman was sitting slightly behind me, and Hazel was there at the far wall, so she could see this woman, and she said she was getting livid, more and more livid by the moment, <laughs> you know. And, but it was interesting, because I did do what I was supposed to do, even if inadvertently. Mm -hmm. Because at a cocktail party at Danny Robbins' house about two weeks later, 
like there were two women standing in the doorway, and mm -hmm. one of them looked reasonably human. Mm -hmm. So I turned to her at one point because there was a lot of slack going mm -hmm. on, right? And I said, well, when you go to a gallery or a museum with a friend, I mean, don't you find you want to look? And if you discuss anything, mm -hmm. it's usually after you've left. Mm -hmm. Like you don't want anything standing between you and the work, right. because that's simply a distraction. I said, if it's necessary to tell these kids about something, mm -hmm. then they know who to ask. Mm -hmm. It's just the way, you know, if you take your kids to a good nursery school, mm -hmm. they're usually left alone. The stuff is all there. They know who the teacher is. Mm -hmm. They don't have to be guided to do right. like, all kinds of filch things or anything. So then she sort of has to nod, mm -hmm. right. And she's the one that told me later that I had split them straight down the middle. <laughs> you know, straight down the middle. This oh. fight went on like, you know, endlessly. Mm -hmm. And finally towards the end, well, at one point Hazel said the woman who was next to her left in a complete huff, like she just About darted there. out of there yeah. like yeah. Anyway, this horrible lady who ran the place, mm -hmm. at one point after I was winding down a bit said well first of all she said you know well your child is different and i said well i've never made a special effort of course she's been around art she's gone mm -hmm. to galleries with me but i really don't think it's different of course i was making all this up right so i wasn't <laughs> sure that was true yeah. but in any case at some point she said something like well, if you just let them loose in the museum, they'll just go look at the mummies. And I said, what's wrong with that? I love mummies. <laughs> and then she really got furious. Right? And I do love mummies. And if a kid comes to the museum to see a mummy, mm -hmm. then the chances are he'll come back to see the mummy and in the process see something else Somehow and get familiar on the and, way in and enjoy out. the museum, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay, and that's the whole point. Mm -hmm. like, like, you know, I said, well, I go to the Met in New York, and I mm -hmm. see young kids like 10 or 11, and they're obviously not there with a group, mm -hmm. and they're looking all around they're the Egyptians. Yeah. Yes, yeah. and they're going there. You know, you see school groups, and it's hateful, because they they want to stop and look, and the teachers say, no, no, no. And I said, of course mm -hmm. you don't let them loose in the whole 200 museum. 200 minutes in 200 minutes. Yeah. yeah, like you can take them to a room <laughs> right. and say, you know, you have to stay in this room. Mm -hmm. But if they want to ask questions, they will. They should mm -hmm. turn each other on. And the interesting thing was that a few days later, I walked in, and the lobby of the museum had a lot of beautiful ancient things. Mm -hmm. Like it was part of the museum, really. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just a lobby. And I walked in there, and off in one corner was a lady clutching a purse and looking very suspicious. And thank God it was working, because all these kids were all over the room. There was not a sound. Mm -hmm. They were not rowdy or anything. Mm -hmm. And they were doing exactly what I said they would do. <laughs> you know, they, they were looking and tugging yeah. at each other and yeah. showing each other things or reading the labels, but mm -hmm. looking mm -hmm. instead of this horrible herd yeah. crap mm -hmm. that goes on. Hate that stuff. Of course, Il Sakaj didn't. But <laughs> <laughs> now, you've had some shows in Provincetown, right? Oh, many. <laughs> and how are they? I've often wondered, you know, Carlos and various people who do. <coughs> exhibitions up there. Do they well, sell things? Is it just for the well, artists? Or, no, yeah, I mean the whole scene is so <coughs> completely different than it was say 10 years ago that mm -hmm. it's really kind of depressing. Mm -hmm. I didn't show it all this year. Well I did. Uh, there was a show at Carlos's of women artists mm -hmm. early in the season. He yeah. invited me to that. Mm -hmm. But in general it's really pathetic because when I first went up the first, the first year, the guy who had the jewelry shop showed a few paintings, like it wasn't a complete mm -hmm. thing, you know, it wasn't a gallery, but he did that summer, or the next summer, I think it was the next summer, 53, show, I think, Wolf Kahn and Lester Johnson mm -hmm. and Gandy Brody, mm -hmm. and I think that was about it, because mm -hmm. it wasn't really a gallery. No. And I don't know when the Sun Gallery opened, but that mm -hmm. was the most vital mm -hmm. because that's where Red showed first. That's right. where I first showed, you know, mm -hmm. at all in Provincetown. And they showed all the young artists. Who ran that again? Uh, Yvonne Anderson and Val Falcone. Yeah. She was a poet and she was a painter, but now she's 
done that Yellow Bowl workshop, which has become unbelievably successful. I mean, I she spends more time is. traveling around. Mm -hmm. Well, it started out by her, I think, running, I don't know if she worked for a school system, because they moved to Everett, Massachusetts. And I don't know if she had a group privately, you know, it mm -hmm. started with her own kids, mm -hmm. like her daughter is just Kate's age. Mm -hmm. And the boy is about two or three years old. And they did sort of cartoon animation films. Hmm. And it became like a whole thing. I mean, she travels like all over the place, setting up this kind mm -hmm. of program and telling people how to run mm -hmm. it. And she showed some films in Provincetown a few years ago. Hmm. And she's really mm -hmm. good. But when they had the gallery, it was really exciting because it was the only place the young artists could show. Mm -hmm. I think Coots opened up there oh, yeah, right. for a while. And then Nat Halpert took over when he right. popped out. Right. And there were a number of galleries that, you know, then it exploded like around mm -hmm. 1958 and there were, I don't know, maybe six or eight mm -hmm. or ten galleries all over town. But did anybody ever sell anything in the summer? Oh, sure. who, who bought things? Well, during 58 when Chrysler opened up its things, oh, there was like another Monopoly game in which I didn't participate, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But I remember there was a guy that I was seeing and I went out to the store to get some groceries, and when I came back, he sold, like, I don't know how many thousand dollars worth of paintings. Like, mm -hmm. one of the collectors had come in and bought uh, something in the uh, 20 minutes I was gone. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. it was like that for about two or three years. Mm -hmm. like it was just an explosion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And people bought, you know, even I sold a few things, but mm -hmm. not much. Mm -hmm. But there was just an enormous explosion. Mm -hmm. And some people who know more about it than I do say that when there was a particular hotel that was run on very old, grand lines, mm -hmm. supposedly, then there was no place much that collectors wanted to stay. Mm -hmm. And maybe the scene was so strong in New York by that time that they didn't mm -hmm. need it or whatever, but mm -hmm. gradually it disappeared mm -hmm. into almost nothingness. So there, there is a market for a certain kind of thing. Carlos apparently did very well because it's the first year, of course, that he's run it himself since it was turned for guys last year. Uh -huh. He was sort of freaking out, but he sold sort of odd things, like not the people he used to sell well mm. did not sell, and then he sold kind of mm. odd things mm. that apparently did very well. Mm. You know, I, mean, I don't think it could have all been sympathy sales. Yeah, money yeah. all the same. Yeah. Uh, one of one of the things that you did, as I guess everybody has done, is uh, the teaching circuit. One well, school after another kind of thing. That uh, what well, started not that? Really true. No, well, I mean, but you've been to various. Only recently. Yeah, but when did that the start? The very first thing I did was a visiting artist thing, I think in 1964, because someone that I knew in Providence, Tony Beavers. Mm -hmm. Have you ever been to Providence? No. Really? No. Never? You poor darling. I keep putting it off. <laughs> go over, go up at Christmas. Oh. Anyhow, he went out to teach at Purdue. Right. And he invited me out for what amounted to, I think, two and a half days or something. Mm -hmm. And that was the very first thing I did. And it was the most casual thing mm -hmm. because it's, well, except that I did what I brought out in school right. later that was similar, where you just go around to the classroom and talk to the students very mm -hmm. informally. Mm -hmm. Then the last thing I did, which I was very annoyed about, because there was a guy who was sort of taking me around to different classes and did some of the graduate student work. And they'd set up like a co auditorium session. This was for the end. This was for doing this right. stuff. And I had never really spoken in front of people. Mm -hmm. And I didn't. Mm -hmm. The idea made me very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, if you stay on one side and Tony stays on the other side, then you don't leave me up there alone. Right? So of uh, course they brought me into the, it's luckily a small auditorium, took me up to the front and then sat down. <laughs> so I was <laughs> left up there alone. There you were. Yeah. And the classroom scene had been fine, mm -hmm. especially in this other mm -hmm. guy who I can't remember the name of. Because the students were good. Actually, the best student was a guy who switched from engineering, which must have killed his parents, hmm. because he was 
from somewhere out there mm -hmm. in Indiana. Mm -hmm. And probably had never known about art until mm -hmm. we got to Purdue. Mm -hmm. And then had gotten his first taste and switched over, right? Wow. And he was certainly the best student in the class. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I vaguely remember like another girl who was mm -hmm. very talented. Mm -hmm. Then I went into Tony's class. And Tony is a foof. And as long as no one's going to, especially Tony's <laughs> going to hear this. Because I went into that class, which was supposed to be more advanced. Mm -hmm. And in the first class, like they were honest, straightforward, no bullshit. And I brought mm -hmm. like two or three small paintings with mm -hmm. me so that they could see what the real paintings looked like. Because I don't even think I had photographs mm -hmm. with me or anything. And certainly no slides. And they asked questions that were completely direct, like about mm -hmm. the surface of the painting, like mm -hmm. things that were real, mm -hmm. right? I go into Tony's class, and he's asking me things like how I live. I mean, the dumbest questions in this mm -hmm. class were asked by him, and there weren't many good ones, partly because the teacher set the tone, right? right? Like in the first class, the guy didn't, as far as I know, didn't do more than introduce me. Mm -hmm or talk very informally, like mm -hmm. I really don't remember, mm -hmm. but it wasn't much. That always seems to be the best. Yes, because <coughs> then the students... You're on your own and they do that. Yeah, and they your... ask like real questions mm -hmm. because they were complete innocents, especially since I presume most of them were from around there, so mm -hmm. their contact was really minimal mm -hmm. and they didn't have any of those pseudo sophistication mm -hmm. of like the yeah. Cooper bit, which yeah. I told you about, yeah. or any of that. And of course mm -hmm. that was earlier, mm -hmm. besides, but it was very straight and fine. And then I went to Tony's class, and of course the dumbest questions he asked, but then he tends to do that anyway. <laughs> but at this, it was very sad in a way, because he gave me a party on the evening of the first day I was there. And I was having a fine time, because I like parties, mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm really a party type. <laughs> And I was having a marvelous time until some point when I guess everyone was getting drunk. And they started coming up and apologizing for it being Indiana. <laughs> All right. And to me, Indiana was very exotic. Like, I'm a native <laughs> New Yorker, right? So I'd like to go out as far west as uh, Indiana, which is still as far mm, west as I've ever been, uh, was extraordinarily exotic. Mm -hmm. So I you know, just kind of blinked, and then I started feeling like this. Mm -hmm. And when I did this auditorium thing, in that case, the students were not very vocal because mm -hmm. most of them aren't unless they've been primed. Mm -hmm. Like this last thing I did at Parsons where the teacher had the first session said, like, how would you like to be up there and show your slides? And then it's ended and nobody opens their mouth. I like that. So that, that was like the easiest thing I've ever done because all during the course of the slides, people were asking questions mm -hmm. and it just continued. And it was, mm -hmm. you know, marvelous. Because when were the Parsons? Uh, about three weeks ago. Uh -huh, yeah. So I, you know, it was perfect. Uh -huh, That's yeah. the way it should be. Uh -huh. You know, when they feel free to ask everything, right, right, including right. like how much did a painting cost, which I refuse to answer, but at least you know, they felt free to answer. <laughs> they always ask that. Well, this is the first time that ever happened. But oh, really? Because yeah. I'm. Most people say that that's a question I always get asked. Well, well, this how do you figure out what are you going to charge for that? Mm -hmm. Oh, no, he didn't ask that. No. He just asked how much that particular painting was. Uh -huh. But in any case, the, what was sad is that one of the only question I really remember is one guy asking, do you have to be in New York to be a painter? Mm -hmm. And I don't remember my precise answer, except that Tony reminded me of it a couple mm -hmm. years ago. And I think I said that sooner or later, like, mm -hmm. you have to face mm -hmm. it. Yeah. I mean, you have to face, if not New York, like one of the big centers, mm -hmm. because, mm -hmm. I mean, I presume at a certain point you could live somewhere else, mm -hmm. but I think you can only do that after yeah, you've kind of established right. yeah. and gone through the thing. And I don't mean mm -hmm. just in terms of, like, mm -hmm. contacts mm -hmm. or professional things, mm -hmm. but I think just in terms of your development, you have to, yeah. like, yeah. meet that challenge, because if you don't, mm -hmm. like, you don't have that feedback. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that means. <laughs> you know, yeah. no, it you makes know, I mean, sense. you don't have that kind You've of. You've got to meet other artists. Yeah, you have to see how you shape up in right. terms of what's going on. Whether you 
like it or not. Right. You know, because right. you have to like face that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. But it was rather sad. You know, that part of it was sad. Mm -hmm. But I really haven't been on the teaching circuit in that sense. I mean, I've no, tried a lot. Well, if you were faster, but you were Yeah, but this was all in the that. last, like, five years. Right, because right. when I needed to, financially. Mm -hmm. But I also felt ready to, because mm -hmm. there was a point at which I was offered a job, like, three times removed. Like, two people had turned it down, and then someone mm -hmm. told me about it. Mm -hmm. But it was to Kansas City. And mm -hmm. What they offered wasn't enough to disrupt everybody again mm -hmm. after that French experience. <laughs> you know, like I wouldn't have made any more money than my husband did mm -hmm. to disrupt mm -hmm. all of us for a year right. to go to some place I didn't really want to be. Mm -hmm. It just wasn't worth it. Mm -hmm. And also, I didn't really try for a long time because I didn't want it too much. Because I didn't feel that I could mm -hmm. verbalize mm -hmm. very much. Mm -hmm. And then. Uh, like after the Rhode Island thing, the next year, George invited me up as a visiting artist for two days, mm -hmm. you know, to do essentially right. the same kind right. of thing, but even more informally, because yeah. that was really awkward, because they didn't even know what my work was like. Mm -hmm. Luckily, I brought a book with me, but I walked in, and, and half the students, I found out later, like they seemed very weird, mm -hmm. that I found out when I got back to George's house where I was staying, because they were probably high as kites, <laughs> you know, like one girl couldn't find her paints, <laughs> you know, and it was quite small studio oh. space. Yeah, yeah. So it was a little peculiar, but then, you know, there were a few good mm -hmm. experiences mm -hmm. still, because as I said before, there are always like two or three people who are really serious, right. and that you can offer something to. Now, what about Sasser? Because that was a lengthy adventure plus the Well, that was Drew Leonard because I needed the money. Because by that time I was at the Hamilton. Mm -hmm. I certainly couldn't afford to do two things. But mm -hmm. that was after Baton Rouge. Baton mm -hmm. Rouge I got right. because Bob was offered it. Bob. Um, Beecham. Beecham, yeah. And I wrote to him, oh, we had just bought a house. And I needed the money, but also I think in the back of my mind I needed to get away, mm -hmm. even though consciously I was just concentrating on the money part. <clears throat> so I wrote to him and said, could you suggest me as mm -hmm. possible as any artist? And he did, and the guy knew my work. It was one of the few people who had never discriminated against women in the school system, mm -hmm. which was refreshing. You know, like not that he made a point of it, but it simply was not. Yeah a problem, like mm -hmm. he wasn't hiring women because he had to, mm -hmm. because I think that was even slightly before it became federally mm -hmm. necessary mm -hmm. to have a certain number of women or minority mm -hmm. hired. And I went down there, and ever since then I've been teaching, mm -hmm. at least more or less. Part, yeah. But How the do you like that? Thing was through Leonard. Hmm? Yeah. How do you like that? I mean, well, it's extraordinarily boring, mm -hmm. which People I've talked to who were like mm -hmm. real artists, <laughs> you know, <laughs> have the same feeling about. Like oh. after about like a month would probably be the right amount of time. If mm. after that the students were sort of on their own, like you still could herd them a bit mm -hmm. after that. But you've really said essentially everything you have to say after about the first two or three mm. sessions. Mm -hmm. And then the rest of it is repetition. Mm -hmm. And it can be extraordinarily aggravating, which it was at Vassar, where the structure was pathetic. I mean, there was no division between beginning, intermediate, and advanced. Really? You mean all in one Well, time? it was on paper, but yeah. if you couldn't register for one, mm -hmm. and that was like the worst mm -hmm. scene of all. But also, there's great antagonism because there was Crete who finally retired, who had wanted a s real separation between the art and art, I mm -hmm. mean, the studio and art history departments, oh, right. which is standard in most schools. But right. in this case, is really ridiculous because the studio department consisted of three people in three miserable studios. Mm -hmm. And if you've spoken to Sidney Guide, you know, he's been there for a long time. You know, it's pretty pathetic. And mm -hmm. I'd ask some students, first of all, the classes are completely overcrowded. And mm -hmm. I asked a few students, you know, like, why are they taking it? Mm -hmm. when they, you know, especially the ones who wouldn't listen to anything I was saying or didn't want to even hear anything. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And they wouldn't even say for relaxation, which is a valid hmm. reason. Mm -hmm. They would say for therapy. Aha! <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. uh -huh. Their analyst said. <laughs> but still, they were like the two yeah. or three students. And yeah. I fought like hell, especially with one guy who reminded me of Leonard. So I had mm -hmm. special feelings towards mm -hmm. him, like physically, he was like mm -hmm. Leonard, but also he was very talented. Mm -hmm. And I fought for months to get him mm -hmm. to like remove the garbage from his work. Mm -hmm. Right. And then after about three months, he finally came up with this incredible drawing. Mm. And I said, that's what I'm talking about. He said, oh, that's the way I used to draw. And then I realized that this creep who was, mm. I mean, he had set it up so that he was teaching the other half of this course, which meant that we had to get together on grades, which is really oh, absurd. Yeah. And he had destroyed this guy's natural thing with all this overlay of shit, like dots and dashes and activated surfaces which is like mm -hmm. the handy way of saying like all this stuff that has nothing to do with anything right now. Oh, yeah. So it was like three months of hard, desperate mm -hmm. work on my part because mm -hmm. this guy obviously was slightly male chauvinist by nature, so mm -hmm. that he tended mm -hmm. not to feel that I was as mm -hmm. b you know, believable in terms mm -hmm. of teaching mm -hmm. as this creep was. But mm -hmm. finally I got him to that point and then of course he was very happy after that, and he's now, as far as I know, at the uh, Boston Museum School or something where he belongs because he's extraordinary. Yeah, yeah. Um.